will be debating someone. Debating someone that I don't even know who the person is, really. I know two things about them. One, they're a neoliberal, and two, they're Japanese. At least that's what that's what um, my sources have told me. <laughs> my, my, uh, my extensive uh, network of spies all across uh, Discord and stuff. So we're going to wait for this guy to get into VC whenever that happens. Uh, I'm assuming this guy knows what time we're doing this because he's, uh, I mean, if he backs out, then that's on him. I heard rumors that this guy was getting off, uh, was getting cold feet, which would uh, be disappointing today. I don't want him to have cold feet, but it would be an easy, easy dub for the channel, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really sorry about this, guys. I, I, I'll reschedule with him probably tomorrow or Monday, if all possible. Um, you know, I really want to debate this guy, but I'm sorry for getting your hypes up and I'm, you know, for everything like that. But, uh, yeah, thank you all for coming anyway. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow or the day after that. Um, follow if you haven't. Yeah. All right. See you. Okay. So both, sorry, sorry. Let me, uh, I have trouble listening when listening to the stream like makes me start hold on. yeah no worries so trade block what do you mean by that like um what three points you want to get across with that okay so the first point is uh both the dprk and south korean anthems were made by a uh, korean japanese collaborator right yes uh, yes this is the bedrock of civilizational ties with the korean and japanese people um uh, every time the anthem is being sung a metaphysical link between the Korean and Japanese people strengthens. Um, the second point is the Big J, allied with the Japanese of the Yamato clan, against the Shiva and the Tang Dynasty. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was an ancient this connection between Korean kingdoms. and Japanese yeah. people, yeah. Uh, fighting against the Chinese and the Shiva. In the aftermath, we welcomed the Korean people from Big J people into Japan who comprise of the, uh, the Japanese people today in fact the richest guy in Japan is Korean yeah mm -hmm. um, so basically the big J royals that fled to Japan intermarried with the Yamato royal bloodline so yep. the royal family is partially Korean yep uh, my third point is both Japan and Korea are Confucian societies mm -hmm. to this day they share similar work at the culture mm -hmm. The ancestral transfer of blood between the Korean and Japanese has manifested in current reality, molding the societies as two sides of the same base. Yep. So basically, those are my three points. Um, uh, I don't disagree with any of them except for the first one. I don't think that just because the anthem was written by a Japanese collaborator means that it's meta, like Korea's metaphysically. Um, connecting with japan i i don't agree with that at all i think that's uh i think that's wrong it's like it's like saying that because karl marx was german or whatever we're metaphysically connect connecting with germany every time you read one of his books the the content of what he wrote is not like german in its essence it's something else it's uh it's a new piece of writing obviously it borrows some german idealism but that doesn't mean that it's it's german at its core right so it's the same thing with the with the national anthems. Just because they were written by a Japanese guy or a Japanese collaborator doesn't mean that we're, you know, connecting with Japan through that. Um it's it's kind of like the like the Confucian tradition of Korea and the Shinto tradition of Japan are like both linked um like through the astral plane. I mean, in the astral plane through metaphysical threads of like destiny and shit. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm not going to argue with you that Japan and Korea have some history together, obviously, before even before the occupation, right? I'm not going to argue with that. Like, but I, I, I disagree that um, that somehow Korea and Japan share um, as common a destiny as you might say. I, I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's true. Um, Korea has always been forging its own path. Uh, separated from China and Japan, at least for most of its history. So I, I don't think that they have a common destiny together.
I mean, like, what about, like, the whole, um, like, bloodline sharing? Um, just because, like, I mean, like, I mean, yeah, sure, there's a lot of, like, uh, aristocrats in Japan that have, like, Korean ancestry and heritage, um, but I, I would, I would say that they're basically the same as, like, uh, collaborators who uh who fled korea to go to japan uh after the occupation ended like it, it's the same thing um they're just they're they're anti-korean right oh like we there's even there's even like i don't know if this is proven or not but i think the first japanese emperor was even like korean i'm fairly sure do you disagree uh yeah i think uh i think you're right no you're right am i right okay all right. Well then, okay. So it looks like we agree basically on like the Confucian ties that Korea and Japan have and like all this other metaphysical stuff. My disagreement with you then is not on history yet necessarily, but um, more on your uh, vision of a tripartite block with Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. Um, I, I disagree with that uh, completely. I disagree with that completely. I mean, it's kind of like the same civilization when we united against China, right? No. Like, no. Not at all. Not at all. That's kind of like. like no, no, just because Bekche, right? just because Bekche, uh allied temporarily with the uh, Yamato, right? What was the what was the plan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just because the they Yamato. allied temporarily with the Yamato doesn't mean that like the they're the same civilization right and they use them like in a geopolitical uh geopolitically to fight off their enemies but that doesn't mean that they were the same people J just because korean uh kingdoms will, would cooperate with china as a uh, tributary doesn't mean that korea was essentially chinese or the same civilization in any in any regard i i disagree with that completely um we might share common confucian roots but that doesn't mean that we are the same uh civilizational essence i don't think that's true and also um sorry go ahead. like what would you consider like a civilization um that's a really difficult question <laughs> that's a really difficult question um okay to be honest i don't really have a set definition i don't think anyone should or even has a set definition right um I think civilization can mean a lot of things. For example, I think that Russia has a civilization, uh, even though it might be composed of different nationalities and stuff like that. They have always had like common uh, heritage with, and not not just common heritage, but common history uh, with many of the uh, other nations within Russia itself. Like the Russian uh, Russian Orthodox people have the same history and same cultural heritage as many of like the Siberian tribes, for example. So they're part of the same civilization. But Korea and Japan, while they might have had some ties in the past and have had contact with each other, doesn't mean that they are the same civilization. They've had thousands of years of separation from one another. Um, the only like m like the majority of history between Korea and Japan was simply um, like just pirate pirate skirmishes on on the sea like that was it and then some like minor trade between the two that was it that was like the extent of the majority of korean and japanese history the times in which korea and japan did actually come into common uh historical um context with one another was during the japanese occupation the three kingdoms period and um yeah that's about it i guess today as well i would say today and then also, like the Big J becoming like part of the Imperial Japan, yeah, Japan yeah, 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 bloodline. yeah. That's what I mean. The Three Kingdoms period, yeah. So that that's like the extent of um, what I would say is uh, Korean Japanese common civilizational. Because because major parts of China have been separated like thousands of years, yet it's but, but still they haven't. civilization, right? But they haven't because a lot of China, uh, Tibet. Uh, Xinjiang uh, and Manchuria have been part of China for centuries now. Um, they've been fully and totally part of the Chinese civilization for a very long time. Uh, but I could not say the same about Korea and Japan. 
while there might have been a period in which Japan and Korea have had, you know, were part of the same kind of historical context together, it doesn't mean that they've established a sort of civilizational dialogue between the two. I would not say that. Because cause it kind of feels like the, the Chinese have, like, bastardized Confucianism under, like, communism. I disagree. And, like, Japan and Korea have held on to their roots. That's why I kind of feel like... I disagree uh, completely. Should, I think yeah. that the opposite is, in fact, true. Um, I think that China, especially under Xi Jinping, has revitalized and brought back to the common sphere uh, Confucian heritage. Um, I mean, you saw, like, even Western media outlets were confused about it at first. Like, go back 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, the news will read, like, oh, China is returning to its Confucian roots. Maybe communism is going to end, like, any day now. Like, that was a common, uh, that was a common headline you would see in, like, 2010. Um, yeah. But then, like, a lot of, like, like, Confucianism, uh, was lost, like, during the Cultural Revolution, right? That's why, like... Yeah. A lot of Chinese went to Korea to learn. Yeah, yeah. No, like, I, I, proper I agree. Confu I agree. Confucianism. Yeah, yeah. I think the Cultural Revolution uh, destroyed a lot of things. Um, I mean, there's not everything about the Cultural Revolution was perfect in any sense of the word. Um, but uh, the uh, I I I am if if you look at like for example the DPRK, the DPRK has had. Uh, decades where it, it's basically been able to maintain Confucianism and even uh, let it grow, uh, flourish under its watchful gaze because yeah, yeah, of its yeah. communist government. And the opposite has occurred in South Korea, where the Republic of Korea has um, uh, adopted, quote unquote, the uh, liberal idea of, of uh, non-culture, the uh, abstract um, depoliticization of the world. They've adopted that into their uh common um sphere uh, sort of like nominally at least like the republic of korea maintains itself as a liberal quote-unquote government but um many of its people still uh keep a lot of the confucian tra confucian traditions whereas in the dprk the confucian traditions are alive and well to the highest level of government right you see school children and um businesses being uh completely and totally open about the way that the their organizations function through confucianism whereas in the republic of korea not only do you have a lack of uh open respect for confucian traditions but also an invasion by western liberal uh, identity politics and other such things uh and western businesses yeah, like into the country communism. right western business into the country that uh, completely and totally throw away the concept of Confucian traditions. For example, um, I know some people in, in, in ROK that, uh, you know, are like managers or whatever at a business, and they have huge disagreements with other managers at their business because their manager, the other people in their business want to uh, throw away the Confucian uh, concepts of uh, respect for your elders and respect for your boss and stuff like that, right? Um, right. So in the Republic of Korea, that's a huge debate. In the DPRK, not at all. And so clearly, communism is doing the exact opposite of what you're saying. In fact, it's not only maintaining, but is letting it, like Confucianism, thrive uh, under its gaze. But but isn't like communism Western German like idealism? I agree. I agree completely. Um, but and, and that's a, that's for uh, that's a lot of what the debate is, especially in China. Um, yeah, because yeah, he's German, not Asian. Right, yeah. Right? But the thing is, is that China has begun to mature and begun to realize that they don't need to adopt everything about what Marx wrote into the Chinese uh, socialist project, right? That's why it's called socialism with Chinese characteristics and not socialism, right? They have a very specific brand. And same thing in Korea, where it's Juche, right? Um, Juche. Uh, so it's, a it's the, it's, a not, not just a rebranding, but a complete and total re new and reinvigoration of communism based upon their national context, whatever that may be. Oh, uh, oh, right. Is it, is it, is it true? Like the DPRK got rid of, uh, like Chinese 
characters? Um, no, I don't think it's true. In fact, I think there are more uh, newspapers and such like that with Hanja in DPRK than there are is in the ROK. In fact, I was just in Korea uh, a few months ago. Uh, oh, no, no, I was sorry. In, I was I in meant, Seoul. Uh, oh, okay. And um, I didn't see a single Hanja character except for on, like, you know, ancient, you know, Buddhist temples and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. There, there's very there's very little of that in, in the ROK, whereas in North Korea, I mean, uh, sure, there's there, there's not a lot, but they still keep it in a lot of places, like uh, business signs and newspaper articles and stuff like that. They'll have Hanja. So they, they clearly do have, a, they, they are clearly attempting to keep Confucianism alive. In fact, when it comes to keeping Confucianism alive, ROK in regards to like religion specifically has been horrible at keeping Western influence and, and the degradation of Confucian traditions at bay. Um, they've um, completely and totally surrendered to Western missionaries and Western church organizations. And they have essentially invaded a large portions of the country to where now like a, like a quarter of all people in the country are now Christians. Like, can you believe that? Christians. Now, of course, I, I, I doubt the veracity of the the majority of people who call themselves Christians in Korea. I feel like a lot of them simply just adapt Confucian traditions onto uh, a, a, Christ, a, a Christian form. But regardless, this is still a, a degradation of Confucian ideals. Yeah, like North Korea removed Chinese loanwords in their uh, Korean. Okay. I mean, we still we still keep uh, Chinese letters and, and, and numbers in, in our system a lot. You know, the way we count still Chinese. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of like or a few similarities in Japanese, too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Like this, you know, we all have like ties well yeah obviously we all have uh, similar ties but we're not the same civilization by any means we don't have the same common history you could say that the um scottish and english nations have common history together therefore they are the same civilization but japanese and korea do not have the same common history and are in fact completely different civilizations yeah like because the ties weren't established under communism, right? Like, under communism, the ties only got severed, right? They were, like, under communism became two Koreas and two Chinas. I would know? disagree. I would say that under Western liberalism, it became two Koreas and two Chinas. If it weren't for the, um, if it weren't for the invasion by uh, the Americans at uh, the beginning of the Korean War... Korea would be unified right now. In fact, if it weren't for their meddling, there would have ne wouldn't have been a war in the first place. Do you know about the history of how Korea became split? Oh yeah, how like China supported North Korea. And no, it goes America it goes far supported. beyond that. It goes far beyond that. In the immediate aftermath of the Japanese surrender, uh, Korea as a whole. There was an idea, of course, of a split Korea yet. Korea as a whole began forming its own self-government. That was actually separate from the uh, quote-unquote government in exile that had existed in China for um, 30 or 40 years. Uh, it began forming its own government, its own city councils, worker councils, this sort of thing. It, all over Korea, it began forming its own government. After the Japanese surrender was formally negotiated and Korea was formally split into two occupational or over administrative zones by the Soviets and the Americans, uh, the Americans came in, uh, saw that the, the Korea was forming its own government and, and thought that the uh, and thought that this this Korean government was communist. It, it was overrun with communists. And so they shot all the leaders of this government and forced the rest to flee to the Soviet uh, occupied North. And so the remnants of this government that was all throughout Korea would eventually form what well, the basis of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, right? And in the South, the US invited the quote unquote government in exile over. Interestingly enough, 
Syngman Rhee had been in this government in exile for 10 years or whatever. He came over to South Korea and formed the Republic of Korea, right? Yeah, like when he said Soviet occupied, right? Like wasn't basically like Stalin invading the South using the North? No, not like, at all. Like under Soviet imperialism? Not at all. The Soviets actually had very little to do with uh, North Korea's invasion of uh, South Korea. Um, the DPRK, like I said, was formed out of the remnants of a previously unified government in Korea, uh, of which the U.S. had destroyed the southern half of it. So the northern, so the rest of it fled to the north. And after that, in the two or three, sorry, three or four years after that event, the D uh, DPRK was able to form uh, itself. And in the south, obviously, the Republic of Korea formed itself. Now, when it comes to the invasion, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea um, yeah, yeah, yeah. thought that it was uh, that the ROK and justifiably thought that the ROK was illegitimate because the ROK was essentially a foreign import government by uh, the Americans. The Americans literally brought them in to form the government. The Soviets had very little to do with the formation of the um, the DPRK. They have very little to do with it. In fact, once the original government before the DPRK, which was called the PRK, People's Republic of Korea, uh, this is the one that I'm talking about that was like the previously unified government. The PRK had uh, come into contact with Soviet soldiers once the Japanese had uh, surrendered. And the Soviet soldiers and the Soviet administrators uh, uh, treated them normally as any other liberated government uh, would have been treated at the time. But the Americans came into the South Korea, saw this same government, and shot their leaders, right? So they fled to the north, as I said. Well, like, well, what do you mean by, like, the, the Soviets weren't, like, part of the, or, like, didn't really do anything? They cause... really didn't. Uh, the DPRK bought weapons from the Soviets um, before prior to the invasion but so did the rok buy weapons from the americans uh, prior yeah, to yeah yeah so don't you think that's like pretty um like um big role um only in so far as the uh republic of korea did the exact same thing um yeah yeah, yeah. like yeah both sides had to materially gather the in enough resources to fund an army for sure but i would not classify either as necessarily uh intrinsically imperialist yeah because I, I would probably consider that like explicit contribution um uh sure i guess only if only if you consider the republic of korea getting weapons from america the same thing in fact it was the probably worse but yeah because south korea wasn't go going to be com communistic right so they were kind of justified well the reason that south korea wasn't communist is because the americans set up a puppet government there and brutally repressed communists there do you know what happened after the dprk uh began its uh liberation of south korea the people, especially around Gwangju, which is the southwest of Korea, uh, revolted, revolted against the fascist government and yeah, tried yeah. to join with the DPRK because they were uh, in favor of establishing a legitimate government in the peninsula. And the ROK brutally repressed this uprising. Well, yeah, why don't, but, but my, I'm wondering, like, why, why don't you think communism should be oppressed? Why do I not uh, think should, should, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, look, okay, look at this logically. Because yeah, isn't the it like I'm giving you so far, mess? purely from an Asian perspective, right? Purely from an Asian perspective, the um, establishment of communism has been a complete and total net good on the entirety of Asia. Because when you look at, for example, the PRC, they have they're probably the richest country in the world. The DPRK despite the sanctions is also has one of the strongest militaries in the world is doing quite well given the circumstances uh vietnam um although you know obviously not as adherent to the principles of communism anymore has been doing quite well under its uh um 
under its rule and has been able to throw off one of the biggest armies in the world, the American army, oh, sorry, one of the most powerful armies in the world, the American army, and all through the usage of communist principles. Yeah, but then, like, my, my thing is, like, communism is, uh, like, foreign it's to East Asia, you know? Well, so is liberal democracy. Yeah. So why do you, why, why do you, if you call yourself a neoliberal and you also call communism uh, evil or bad for some reason, you can't just say that communism is a foreign idea because you are also coming from the same perspective. It's a neoliberalism is a foreign idea. I would say even more foreign than communism. I mean, do you know where you got your government from? You literally copied it from the British, right? <laughs> the national diet's literally a British invention. Well, yeah, but like capitalism is like compatible with feudalism, right? I disagree completely. Capitalism is not feudalism. But like feudal businesses and capital businesses are almost the same thing. No. Uh... Capitalism fought for over a century to violently overthrow feudalism. Like, feudalism and capitalism are... Feudalism is literally the precedent before capitalism. Capitalism requires feudalism to arise, but once it arises, it completely sublates and uh, subjects feudalism to the dustbins of history. Like, it, it doesn't... It, they, they are not compatible with one another. I mean, because modern day corporations are like the same as like old feudal merchant organizations, you know. Um, old feudal like, merchant. Like or you mean thing. merchant organizations? Like, okay. Like first, old first of feudal, all, yeah. first of all, while they might have similar ties, similar roots, they are not the same. Ain't like feudal, like banks, especially feudal banks and feudal merchant uh, guilds. Um, while they might have given rise to modern banks and modern corporations are completely different in essence. Mutal, uh, feudal uh, merchant guilds, for example, um, are, were comprised of artisans and um, other uh, small scale uh, merchants, right? Small scale traders, right? Not the same of not the same kind of corporate like organized, and highly efficient corporations that we see today that mass produce products to sell on the market. Um, the concept. Yeah, of that's because because we're, we're like way more advanced today, you know. Well, that's the point. That's the point. When once you advance the forces of production, uh, things are set into motion that cannot be undone. Uh, the perfect example of this is feudalism and capitalism. When once capitalism arose out of the merchant class and out of the banking class, they completely and totally sublated the old feudal order of things yeah, uh, through this landed is like, aristocracy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like, because this, this is only possible under capitalism, right? Yeah. Right. So that's that's my point. Once capitalism arose out of feudalism, feudalism was no longer necessary. Uh, and, and in fact, was uh, illogical to retain. So capitalism itself is not not necessarily an either a good nor bad force. It just is. It, it rises out of the development of technology. Therefore, uh, ergo uh, forces of production. Right. It arises out of that development. Um, and it's the same thing with communism. Same thing with socialism, rather. Yeah. So what I'm saying is like, the the feudal system something authentic to east asia uh evolved under capitalism and like made it better but here's the thing here's the thing feudalism is not while feudalism is not the same in asia as it was in europe okay feudalism in asia right. had a completely and totally different setup and in fact marx talks about this when he discusses the asiatic mode of production right feudalism in asia was highly subjected towards uh, centralized era, um, bureaucracy and centralized uh, leadership, right? That's why many people, uh, well, that's why, um, for example, the Infrared Collective calls ca uh, communism, sorry, calls feudalism in Asia uh, or the old system in Asia before capitalism communist because its entire 
economic forces of production were directed by a sort of um, pre-universalist um, uh, king or or leader, right? Uh, so, um, the, the forces of production were organized by them, right? So the uh, concept of feudalism in Asia is completely and totally alien to that of uh, Western Europe, which in which the kings were weak and subject to the nobles' power, right? A completely and totally different setup. Well, well, but wouldn't you like consider like corporations are like basically centralized power, like ancient feudalized feudal systems, right? And, like a monopolies. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it's like compatible. Um. No, I mean you can make an allegory. You can make an analogy between modern corporations and uh, the feudal system, but in reality. Uh, the feudal system is like two or three stages of production behind uh, modern corporations, right? Modern corporations have a completely different kind of setup. They're socialized in their essence. Uh, they are, in, in other words, the way in which our goods are brought to us and the way in which they're produced and transported between factory and farm are socialized and monopolized. Like they are... Um, subject to cartel interests, right? And these corporations themselves are subject to uh, financial bank interests, right? That is not the same as uh, ancient uh, European or even especially Asian feudalism, not even close, right? Uh -huh. So this parallel you're trying to draw, while useful because of how much, like, for example, we see in um, America, our, our land being bought up by corporations like and like people like Bill Gates, like we can see like neo feudalism, but it's more of an allegory or an analogy than it is a, a direct parallel, direct comparison. They're not compatible, right? Well, do you think like communism is uh, compatible with Confucian roots? Because I would say communism being like German German idealism, yeah, right? Yeah. When the Chinese eventually reaches full communism, they'll have to remove their Confucian roots, right? I disagree. I disagree. Um, see, do you remember when I, I brought up just a couple minutes ago, I called um, ancient Asian societies communist mm -hmm. because they have a sort of um, strong leader, central leadership that develops the forces of production in the interest of the people, right? We see this time and time again, especially in ancient China, in ancient the Mongolian Empire, for example. Like, all these societies were pretty damn communist, right? Um, while this system was articulated by German idealism, this was only important for Europe, right? Uh, because Europe has basically been like a backwards... Uh, barbarian peninsula for like 2000 years and it needed like this essentially um, this this uh, babying by the German idealist to be able to realize like what true civilization actually means whereas Asia has already known about this for like thousands of years right they already know how to organize a society that's what Confucianism is right right so uh, sorry, go ahead okay So, like, are you praising the Mongols or? Yeah. But then, didn't they kind of like? Yeah, they invaded invade Korea. Korea. Yeah, they they did. I'm not going to dispute that. Um, but the, the difference is between the Mongol invasion and, for example, the Japanese occupation was the Mongol invasion. While yes, they did commit atrocities because it was a war. Once they. Uh, one, they basically let let Korea govern itself, right? All they needed was like soldiers and and occasionally some tribute. Uh, the way in which the Japanese occupied Korea was a full blown like attempted integration into Japan. Uh, it was a tr it was an attempted it was an attempted raping and pillaging of the country itself, right? They withheld industry and subjected the country to um, 
numerous atrocities and such for a, a war machine to gather natural resources for the main, for the home islands, right? Well, but they also like built Japanese, I mean, built infrastructure in Manchuria, right? Yeah, I'm not going to disagree. And um, like they, they, like they, they, they built the necessary infrastructure to maintain the war efforts and to extract as many resources as possible. But yeah, like it, it wasn't they, it wasn't well, like self governance or uh, rulership it's, it's, for the benefit of the people in any way. You know, well, it's because they never got to the winning part, right? Like, well, they did win. They did win. They won the first and second Sino-Japanese War. Well, because, like, where I see it from, it's like Japan built infrastructure while, like, the Mongols were known for, um, like, Being, destroying, yeah. like, wooden structures in Korea. No, I'm, I'm not going to disagree. Um... But I, the the extent to the Mongols' destruction was militarily uh, prudent and not a uh, again not an entire integration into Mongolia. Like they weren't trying to make make Korea Mongolia too. Like Japan tried doing that with Korea. They tried to make Jap like Korea Japan, but on the mainland of Asia. But like it wasn't it wasn't the same, right? completely different i mean well yeah because because like zero wooden structure remained in Korea, right yeah like yeah whereas you know at least there was infrastructure by japan well yeah but that that's because the mongols like didn't want korea revolting because again they left the administration of the country in korean hands can you imagine if the japanese let korea govern itself basically they would have never have built um, you know, as big of military installations as they did, right? It was just, it was militarily prudent. I'm not going to praise the Japanese invasions like they were some sort of, like, <laughs> For sure. heroic, uh, heroic uh, event, right? Obviously, it was extremely brutal, yeah. right? But right. that's what For sure. every single, like, it's just a historical fact. Like, you just have to recognize, like, okay, it yeah. happened, what came out of it, and what came out of it was a new Mongol universality that completely and totally changed the face of the earth and established yeah, but like you, you know i don't know about like like the whole korea being able to self-govern because you know it's, they kind of still have to listen to the mongols right well i mean if they if they had like foreign policy issues sure i mean they were still part of an empire right but as long as Korea maintained its, uh, you know, uh, loyalty to the Khan or whatever, Korea was able to govern itself completely. Um, I'm sure it wasn't as lenient as, for example, its tributary status to China, but its tributary status to China was like, like so tiny. Like it had to give such a tiny tribute every year. It was ridiculous. And they just kind of recognized them as like, you know, as most Asian empires did. I'm, I'm sure you're aware uh, you know, just recognize them as like, yeah, okay, we we know Confucianism came from you. We're culturally connected. Uh, we're gonna give you acknowledgement of that fact, right? Um, even Japan did that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cause cause I see it as like as like Japan building like Asia against the West, you know, like Japan was building a trade block with East Asian countries yeah, and Bill I, Clinton ruined it. I disagree completely. Um, Japan was not building a, a trade, like an amicable, mutually beneficial trade agreement with the rest of Asia against so-called Western imperialism. That is like the line given by Shinzo Abe and his, uh, what was it called? The National uh, Association or whatever. Like, that is the argument given by the Japanese during the period of imperial expansion. That is that is what fueled, that's what ideologically fueled Japanese expansion in Asia, right? They said that they were simply protecting the peoples of Asia against the West, when in reality, they yeah, were protecting yeah. them against shit. They were subjecting them to far worse than even the West could imagine, right? 
when the West heard about what happened in Manchuria and uh, what happened in Nanjing, they were horrified, right? Absolutely horrified. Yeah, Nippon Kaigi. That's what it's called, yeah. Like, the concept of Pan-Asianism and this tripartite trade pact that you're trying to uh, propose is eerily similar to how the Japanese conducted itself diplomatically and ideologically during the 1900s, right? That's that's very, very eerily similar. Sorry, sorry, can you, can you say again that last, my, my dog was fucking... Yeah, no worries. I'm saying that what you are saying as this tripartite pact a trade block against China or uh, this concept of pan-Asianism is exactly the same sort of ideological and diplomatic framework that was given by the Japanese imperialists during the time of Japanese expansion. It's what ideologically and, and fueled uh, their uh, thought processes, right? Uh-huh. And what you are proposing is eerily similar to that. Right, but like, you know, less war. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, Sun Tzu himself said that the sublime art of war is subduing the enemy without fighting, right? And Japan it's... would have gladly taken Korea. In fact, it did, basically. I mean, it didn't have to fight Korea, technically. It fought China for it. Uh, well, well not, that's not true. But you, you know what I mean. Like, if, if Japan could just instantly take Korea... Again, it, it easily would. And what you're proposing, a unified Korea that happens to be ideologically in line with Japan, as well as Taiwan. Well, under, under South Korea. Well, it doesn't matter. Who, it doesn't matter which, are, which government controls it. If it's ideologically con, like, uh, uh, subservient to Japanese uh, ideology, same thing with Taiwan, it's just a rejuvenation of the Japanese empire. Like, what are you saying? Do you have anything to say to that? Sorry. Uh, well, uh, one more time. Please, please say again. I'm saying Sorry. that your proposed agreement, trade block, is essentially mm -hmm. a rejuvenation of the Japanese Empire. Because it doesn't matter which government controls Korea. If it's ideologically subservient to Japan through this so-called trade agreement... It's a just a recreation of the Japanese Empire, but with less steps. You know, it, it's why Germany's uh, position in the EU is sometimes equated towards a Fourth Reich, because they've essentially taken Europe without firing a shot. You know, it's the same thing. No, I just want Japan or like... <laughs> I want um, like Asian people coming into modernity without like the co corruption of the West. I can understand what you're saying from this specific phrase that you just said. Um, but I would argue that they've already come into modernity. It's just a matter of who's controlling it, right? If you look, again, if we go back to our, our DPRK versus ROK example, the DPRK has entered modernity uh, and has left Confucianism relatively scot-free, right? Confucianism is alive and well in DPRK. Whereas in the ROK, which is democratically elected, supposedly, and is uh, ideologically liberal, Confucianism has been degraded. It has been completely and totally destroyed. And the same thing with Japan. You know, Japan doesn't even have a... Ba basically, doesn't even have sovereignty. Same thing with ROK. Because uh, they're both subservient to America and American interests, and American religion, American corporations, American uh, cultural ideals. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have in Japan 
people protesting the fucking Roe v. Wade thing, right? There's got to be some people in Japan that are, are angry about that for some reason, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So this is what you are saying that we need to bring people into modernity uh, without the West tainting influence. I would say that's already happened. It's just not happened where we are, right? It's happened in China, and it's happened in North Korea, but it's not happened anywhere else. You see what I'm saying? Um, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, the trade block is will be more like mutual cooperation, not like an empire. That's nice. But we all know that, like, under especially under a liberal regime, this would not happen. Now, if you want like a mutual trade agreement between right. all Asian countries, which I support, by the way, that would have to happen under communist uh, guidance, right? For example, the DPRK has, for many decades now, attempted to rekindle its relationship with uh, Japan. It's attempted to establish diplomatic rapport with them, right? And uh, Japan has kind of responded to that in in, in turn. Um, yeah, like it's like the EU, right? The no, oh, no, 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 no. The no, EU no. built up uh, Eastern Europe, like the EU gives free money to. No, 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 okay. not like the EU. I'm I'm okay with having trade agreements, like for example, the Eurasian uh, Economic uh, Cooperation Organization, what it's called. Um, like that's fine. But not like the EU, because the EU is attempting to establish itself as a political entity, uh, like with one with sovereignty. That's not what is appropriate for Asia, because even if we can agree that like, oh, yeah, maybe it would be better if Asia was unified politically against the West. There isn't the room culturally, historically, uh, personally for a united Asia against the West. That just there just isn't the room for that. Um now, we might be able to agree that, yes, the West's influence is um, bad, but the first thing we got to do to get rid of that is to overthrow U.S. American occupations of Japan, Korea, and uh, potentially Taiwan if they stop sending weapons. Uh, yeah, I have two questions about that, what you just said. Uh, one is, like, why does it have to be co communist and why not liberal? And then, why, why, why does... Why don't you want it to be political? Because no political power means, like, weakness. So, I'll answer your first question. So, your first question was, why, why communism, like right? Yeah. So, first of all, liberal governments have this veneer of apolitic, uh, apoliticality, right? They have this veneer of, okay, we are the system, right? The system has its own essence, and it is free and totally separated from uh ideology and political bias right that's what like the court system is for example right uh if you look at america the court system is supposed to be this uh quote unquote neutral or unbiased look at like what happened at a crime and try to figure out what happened based upon and and judge what should be done from a neutral quote unquote point of view the problem with that is that in some way or another it's hiding this it's hiding behind this veneer of apoliticalness and it's hiding a, a deeply unsettling and deeply imperialist uh, ideology behind it. Because when we look at liberal societies, uh, if take a look at Japan, it's businesses, it's economy, everything that runs Japan is ultimately and totally subservient to American financial interests. If you look especially at the 80s, Right when Japan was finally starting yeah, yeah. to get, like its own economic independence, guess what happened? The U.S. imposed trade embargoes. They completely and totally flooded the market with American dollars, and That's, the Japanese yeah, economy yeah. fell. Right, the Japanese economy fell. The reason it fell is because America does not want competition. Right, but more specifically, it's not just America that doesn't want competition. It is American financial organizations that do not want competition specifically wall street and london right yeah it's like the key the west keeps uh, you know like messing with japan korea and china that's why we have to unite against the west okay but here, here's the thing here's the thing right so returning back to my your, your one and two points right 
my oh right, right, right so what i'm saying is that's why we cannot have a liberal form of government because even if it's not america that's doing the financial uh, imperialism it's going to be someone in the end right and that someone is going likely to if, if let's say that both china japan korea all these people are all liberal governments now someone is going to be financially imperializing someone and it's probably going to be either japan or china right that's not oh, what is best for the people of Asia. We have no army now. <laughs> well, it, it doesn't matter if you have an army or not. It's financial imperialism, like imperialism in the in the Marxist sense, where it's it's not necessarily military uh, action that's imperialist. It is financial monopolization that is imperialism, right? And that is what is concerning about uh, liberal governments in Asia, because if let could be South Korea too. Though. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. But South Korea's financial po power is f fairly limited, especially when it comes to China and Japan, right? I mean, Japan and China just have bigger populations. It's, it's simple math, right? So their economies are probably going to be larger, and Korea is going to be out, outmoded and outproduced, and therefore financially imperialized by one or the two. That's why liberal governments cannot happen. Now, your second point was... Um, um. Uh, why not political? Like, yeah, no not political, political power means so, uh, weakness. Obviously, obviously, I, the the saying that the, you can't have politics is a bit of a misnomer. Everything is political in the end, but the structure of such a trade agreement, trade uh, organization between all the Asian countries must be non-sovereign, which is a huge difference. The EU, right? Regardless of its actual Whoa. trade agreements between the member states is attempting to model itself after a kind of sovereign government. It has a parliament, it has uh, a house, basically, it has a president, it has a prime minister, right? It has all these things that will make up a sovereign government. The only thing it doesn't have, really, is an army, which it's trying to establish at the moment, right, with Frontex. But mm -hmm. the... So a better example would be, uh, again, the Eurasian Economic Organization, where it is a mutually beneficial a series of agreements between all the powers involved there is no set prime minister there is no parliament there is none of that it is simply a, an agreement of between powers to establish mutual ties uh for for all's benefits right then why is the eu bad then it's like the new rome that's it's like a civilization <laughs> see that's the issue right um eu I would argue so its member states have many different with okay let me let me rephrase this the eu was attempting to posit itself as a sort of new new version of european civilization a new version of european modernity but here's the issue with that the eu itself is comprised actually of several civilizations several um for example there is the the rhine civilization between France and Germany and the lowlands. There is the Mediterranean civilization with Italy, Spain, Turkey, I'm sorry, not Turkey, Greece, for example. And there is the, uh, you know, British civilization between Ireland, Scotland, and England and Wales, right? There is a specific form of uh, civilizational context that needs to happen before Europe can truly be called its own kind of entity, its own sovereign. Uh, and the EU itself is basically a farce. It basically is saying that all these nations, all these civilizations are actually don't exist. It's only one, it's only one nation. It's only one civilization, the European civilization, which has never happened in the history of Europe. Uh, even during Rome, uh, like when it was fully united, united and everything like that, um, it had many different kinds of nations within it, sure. But it, it also uh, never attempted to posit itself as... Uh, all encompassing European because there wasn't such a thing as all encompassing European yet anyway. Right? Yeah, yeah. It didn't. Like, it didn't even have Germany in it. It didn't have Germany. Didn't have the Baltics. Didn't have Scandinavia. Didn't have Eastern Europe. Um, and it, but interestingly enough, it had North Africa and it had Morocco and Algeria. Why don't we consider those European? Well, the reason that people give is that oh, now they're Muslim and uh, now they're uh, uh, now they're uh, you know Arab and stuff like that, but. I thought Europe was not about nations or uh, uh, 
ethnicities or anything. Like I thought it was about common European Roman heritage. Clearly, no, it's just no, no, because no. like modernity built the new Rome, right? Civilization is coming together. This is how you build greater civilizations, right? Like mm. all these nations can keep their own languages. So the EU does recognize each nation's own importance. Yeah, that, but that this is what I'm saying. The EU itself, European civilization, is a vague, undefined concept that is yet to be given uh, express material. Um, is being yet to be given material expression. It doesn't exist. It, it is a farce, right? They're attempting to create it, but it doesn't exist right now. There's no reason for it to for it to have its own civilizational um, boundaries, let's say. Uh, but a civilization like Russia certainly does, right? Because it's controlled. It's it's had a it's had its own territory for uh, centuries. It's had a common territory, common history, religion, language, etc. Right. Well, you don't think like material expression is the EU? Um, no, not yet. Oh, it could be. Maybe. I mean, it would it would take a long time before that happened. It would be like thousand years <laughs> before Europe could be defined as its own civilization. It would also probably have to have a common religion too. Uh, and it certainly does not have that. I mean, there's very clearly a split between Catholicism, Protestantism, and within Protestantism, uh, you know, Anglicanism, Calvinism, Lutheranism, etc. Like, Europe is a patchwork of religions, of civilizations, and of nations, and does not have a common civilizational context uh, for which to stand on its own two legs. The only way European civilization could come into existence is in uh, opposition to other outside regions specifically especially in the modern day russia uh the middle east asia in, in generally uh africa uh america like it has its own it's the only re the only way that it can come into existence in the mind is through the uh opposition of other uh regions other civilizations the, yeah like russia has different religions in in it right china has like Taoism, yeah, yeah, yeah. Buddhism, Muslims, yeah, yeah. Again, again, it's not it's not the religion that matters. It's not it's oh. a combination of things, right? Civilization. Means yeah, it's like a combination, multiple. right? It's an it's an amalgamation multiple of everything. Nations. And Europe doesn't have that amalgamation. What? How come? Why don't you think like EU doesn't have that like amalgamation? amalgamation well like i said europe the european union has only can has only come into existence ex extremely recently it doesn't have a common history uh, it, yeah, it might have like certain elements that are similar but it's not like europe as a whole was like for example you know attacked uh, or europe as a whole the collectively decided that it will do this thing now or europe as a whole did this or that europe is extremely divided on civilizational and national uh, lines um, like for example Eastern Europe votes basically no on every single major piece of legislation that the EU wants to get across because Eastern Europe is its own uh, polarity it's its own sort of separate thing uh, the uh, it, Italy Spain Portugal these three nations vote pretty similarly as well through uh, especially like um, for example Portugal has fishing rights Italy has gas Spain has a bunch of shit. Spain is in a shithole position right now, but you know, you, you know what I mean. Spain, Italy, Portugal, Greece. These kind of nations have a similar kind of uh, outlook, context, history that defines them as a separate civilization within the European Union. Yeah, I think like the the EU will erode those lines. Like Europe becoming one is its historical destiny, right? Like I disagree. Europe has always been been becoming one i i disagree i think that europe has had three or four separate identities uh and that still even exists today i mean if we want to go back to ancient rome uh we have western rome we have britannia we have germania we have the eastern roman empire and within the eastern Roman empire you have the aegean versus the anatolian you have the levant versus the uh, Egyptian, right? 
um, and in Eastern Europe, Poland versus Belarus, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine versus Moldavia, right? But, a- but if you admit Europe is the fourth uh, Reich, uh, uh, does that mean it's the new Germanic unified uh, Europe? But it's, it's clearly it's clearly not Germanic though. I mean, the the only reason I call it the fourth Reich is because it's basically what the Germans wanted to do, um, but with um, less ethnic cleansing though they're trying to do that um uh, i can think of so basically the way that the eu operates is that it's essentially subservient to german financial interests i mean on a more general scale it's it's american and british but on a local scale europe european politics are subject to german financial interests uh that includes france italy germany czechia austria Denmark, all these people are subservient to ger- ger- German financial interests and German yeah, therefore, yeah. German political interests, which is why I call European Union the fir- Fourth Reich, because that's what it is. It's what the Germans yeah. want to establish. It's Germ- Germanic and leading European in essence. So it's like Europe uniting under German. It's, it's the new Roman civilization. Yeah, and that that's not that's not that's not civilizational though. That's not civilizational. What it is is occupational right it's germans occupying europe through uh financial coercion it's not a mutually uh beneficial arrangement where all the nations and civilizations of europe are coming together to form a civilizational bond no it's one force imposing itself upon the other through coercion especially financial and not uh through not the other way around but the europeans agreed to germany well, like, you can say that they agreed, but on. in reality, they were completely and totally occupied by America, and still are to this day. And America was able to create the conditions necessary for Germans to step in uh, using the uh, industrial output and therefore financial output of their country to overtake the rest of European parliaments and uh, political systems. Because, as we know, in liberal democracy, politicians are paid off by big corporations, and all these big corporations are ultimately paid off by the Germans. Then do you think the Han Chinese are occupying China then? No. Because the Han Chinese don't impose themselves upon others. Uh, if you want to look at Xinjiang, for example, uh, Xinjiang is like, the, it has its own form of governance. It is its own separate province, first of all. Second of all, it has had, has had centuries of mutual contact with the Eastern Chinese civilization to the point where it's become Chinese in its essence through Confucianism and, uh, uh, you know, that sort of thing, right? And a common historical bond. That's what's really important, a common historical bond. Xinjiang might have been uh, taken through force, but the way it's been retained within the Chinese civilization has been through mutual contact and not through coercion. But, dude, they're, like, literally occupying Taiwan and Xinjiang. How are they occupying Taiwan and Xinjiang? I mean, Taiwan's its own like, thing. Taiwan is public of China. Like when the Han Chinese went over and basically genocided. They didn't genocide. All the um, aboriginals. And they did Almost not, all they did not genocide them. That was the Dutch. That was when that Taiwan was still called Formosa. Yeah, I'm pretty sure um, the... You, you, you want to know why China oh, has... Yeah. There's even Chinese on for, on Taiwan in the first place? It's because the Dutch brought them over. The Dutch literally brought them over as cheap workers and then killed off the rest of the aboriginals and forced them on the eastern side of the island. Yeah, because... Uh, well, I'm pretty sure when Chiang Kai-shek went over, like, a uh, lot of aboriginals died. Yeah, you want to know why? It's because they were communists. They were communist sympathizers, and he killed them. Also, um, don't you think the Han Chinese, like, uh, putting millions of Uyghur children through boarding school systems deprives them of their uh, local culture? Um, Okay, I'll give you, I'll answer that with a question. Uh, Do you think that Americans putting millions of uh hispanic and black children in the public school system is a uh 
equation of cultural genocide? Do you, do you think that Japan putting Korean communities in Japan through Japanese school is uh, equating to cultural genocide? <laughs> but um, American culture isn't real, right? What do you mean? Of course it is. There's many cultures in America. Just like there's many cultures in China. There's many cultures in America. Yeah, yeah, but then the Uyghurs are being forced like Han Chinese culture upon them while like there's no like no, one not. American culture you know like American culture is like a combination of like like Hispanics yeah uh, yeah and it's the same thing with China I mean China will okay so in the public school, school system in America you might not be know, aware of this there is a standardization level that must be met by all public schools right so in a way all cultures in America, regardless of where they're from and who they are, they're all put to the same system, basically. Uh, the similar textbooks, similar kind of uh, reading, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's the same kind of education throughout most of the country. In Xinjiang, yeah, they're subject to Chinese education, but this education is taught mainly by other Uyghurs and is taught uh, using um, parts of, some, I think some classes are even in uh, the Turkic language that they have there. Like it's a it's a separate thing that doesn't eradicate their culture. They're just exposed to the outside world because Xinjiang is kind of a kind of a rural backwards province in many ways. <laughs> okay, yeah, but then the Uyghur children like are being forced to learn Han culture. Like no, they're not. I'm talking about schools. Like I'm talking, they're they're like boarding schools. Where they get taught specifically hand culture. So wait, you're complaining that Uyghur children are being sent to other parts of China to receive a better education because that's somehow no, no, no. in cultural. I'm talking about like to learn hand culture, not like. Well, it's not just uh, to learn hand culture because they're being sent to all parts of not, China. Not just like they're being sent to southern China, for God's sake, like southern China. Uh, I think even some are being sent to Tibet. You know. Outer Mongolia or Inner Mongolia? Like, how, like, how is it better in different, or like Tibet or whatever? Like, how is it better there? The, wait, where? Like, you, well, when they're being sent to like other places. Well, they're given a better worldly understanding through that. I mean, like, it, you would be if you had a kid and that kid was being sent off to, like, if you had the option to send your kid to um, America or to Europe for an education, that would be amazing because that they would receive a more a thorough understanding of the world, right? They would receive education that's not just simply the local uh, education, right? Dude, but Asian like education is much better than. <laughs> no, I, I know, I know. I'm I'm just I'm just giving you an example, right? Where example of let let's say you're like a I don't know, let let's say you're from. Uh, Mexico and your kid gets to be able to send to a school in like Spain or something like that. You're going to, you're going to accept that opportunity because you know, Spanish schools are, you, okay. Let's say the schools are of equal quality. Um, oh. If you're just going to another place in the world, you're just, you're going to get a more thorough understanding of how the world works. And it's the same thing with Uyghur children. Yeah. But then like, are these all like willing, you know, willing like like they're, they're not forced i mean the only thing they're forced to do is go through school but that's what that's what every country in the world does fair so it's it's yeah you know xinjiang is uh is not being genocided culturally by the han chinese there's no such thing as han nationalism that just that, that doesn't exist it's a it's Western uh, barbaric uh, idealism implanted into Asia. It's the same thing. Okay, cause shit, everyone says they're forced. That's why. No, uh, I mean, obviously, people are forced to go to school. Who isn't, right? I was forced to go to school. You were too, I'm sure. No, no, no I'm like forced to leave, like and sent to. You said like Tibet and southern China. Well, I, I don't think that I don't think that happens. I mean, I think they can choose to go. 
I don't think they're forced to go. Yeah, because honestly, it's like the I feel like it's the same as like the residential school system in Canada for the natives. Yeah, it's it's not you know? it's not the same. It's not the same. Uh, they're kind of like they they do not erase the they do not erase Uyghur culture at, in schools in Xinjiang. They are no. they they are wow. taught certainly like a standardized system of um, education. I mean, I'm sure they're still taught math and stuff like that, but it's all taught in the Uyghur language side by side with Han Chinese. Sorry, with uh, Mandarin Chinese. Um, so yeah. Yeah, but then what I'm saying is they're not only being forced to learn like math and science right there they're 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 like being forced to go to these boarding schools they're taught like han chinese culture confucian culture um, I mean, according to ccp documents apparently i mean even if they were forced i i see no problem with that in fact you know if like kids from like i, I would say this then both of these examples work if kids from like new york city were forced to go to school and like um rural Missouri, I would fully 100% support that. And the same thing, if rural kids in Missouri were sent to go study in New York, I would also support that as well. It would be cross-cultural uh, exchange and mutual dialogue between both of these specific identities and would allow them to have a better understanding of one another, able to work together in the same sort of civilization. And in China, that's even that's it's even more pronounced, right? So even if they were forced, which I'm not conceding even if they were forced i would be uh okay with it because it's not all of them so like let's say i feel like that's a false comparison though because like new york and mississippi isn't the same as xinjiang and beijing right like because xinjiang has their own authentic muslim turkic culture okay yeah that's fair enough but um i would say that it's still I think that it's still fine. I, 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 I still think it's fine because they're not forced to become, um, but they're not forced to abandon Islam. They're not forced to do any of that. Uh, they're just simply exposed to more. Uh, yeah, they're being like forced to be exposed to hand Confucian culture. Well, they according are to part CCC. of the same country. I mean, they still want them to have, you know, cooperation between them. Like they don't want the Xinjiang province to feel like it's been abandoned or have, feel resentment towards the central government. Right. And they don't want, they don't want people in Xinjiang having uh, conflicts with people in other provinces. Right. That's just not what they want. They want them all to be same. the part of the same country. They want them all to be Chinese. Right. Well, uh, would you be okay with like Koreans being forced to learn Mandarin then? Um, no, because Korea isn't part of the uh, Han Chinese civilization or the Chinese civilization. And I think a better example would be, would I be okay with um, uh, Native Americans, like uh, Indian tribes being sent to Vancouver or, or California for uh, education, right? Yeah, and would you be okay with that? Here's the major difference, right? The Indian tribes... Ha, are been, have been treated completely and totally unequally for their entire existence while America has been around, right? Can't same with Canada. Um, Xin, uh, Xinjiang is given its own sort of autonomy. It's given its own place in the world. It has its own land. It has its own culture. It has its own people. The native tribes of America have never ever had that within the American context. They have been uh, stolen from, they have been lied to, they have been raped, pillaged, etc. by the American government. And saying that, you know, we should grab uh, native kids from reservations and send them to boarding schools in America is outrageous. Let's yeah, say, yeah. let's say the uh, Indian tribes manage to have more land. Let's say they have their own, they're given their own set borders, their own self-sufficiency, their own language, they're able to do whatever the hell they want within their borders. They can do simply anything that they want within their, uh, within their autonomy, within their sovereignty, right? And they are given enough representation within the government, the American government, right? Let's say now the American government wants to send uh, Indian kids 
to uh, American schools to have a better learning, better learning, stuff like that. It's completely and totally different to the uh, previous example of something that actually happened with boarding schools, because in boarding schools, they were purposely stripped of their national culture, stripped of their religion, stripped of their language, stripped of their even their, their hair um, and were uh, treated horribly in these schools, treated horribly. It was a complete and total cultural genocide. Whereas in China, Uyghur kids aren't forced to do anything, really. The only thing they can't do is uh, wear certain beards, and, and I think that's it. But that's within Xinjiang, I think, only. Although it might but, be it might be countrywide, cause, but... Because children's, <laughs> children's don't have beards. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, teenagers do, but, though. Teenagers do. I sent, I sent you a DM, by the way. I kind of... Oh, okay. Well, we can wrap it up now then. Um, I, okay, I think, yeah, yeah. I think we right. mostly agree about a lot of things, actually. The only thing I disagree with you about is your proposed um, trade, trade block. block. Um, if we have another discussion, I, I would like to convince you of the efficiency of communism, the anti-Westernness intrinsic in it, because uh, I want to have another discussion about that. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I want to, okay. I want to red pill you on this shit. Because I think that Japan has a lot of unlocked potential in it. If it weren't so diluted for the past 100 years, 120 years by um, Western idealism. I might agree with you on that. Yeah. So if you want to have another conversation, you know, okay. uh, just DM me. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Thanks for the talk. Yeah, no problem. It was really great having you on. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, sorry for being like late. Or, yeah, not even late, but like I didn't even out? show up. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, I, right. I, 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 I didn't. I didn't think you actually lived in Japan. I thought you lived in America. So. Um, oh yeah, I like back and forth. You know. Yeah. All right. So but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, see you later. Okay. Yeah. Have a good one. Thanks. You too. Yeah, that was actually a pretty great uh, discussion. Um, that was actually way better than I. That went way better than I thought I thought it would. Um, though to be fair, the guy had been really respectful in my DMs, so I had, I had very little concerns about this becoming like uh, vitriolic. <laughs> but yeah, that was actually pretty damn good. Um...